wisdom and insight from on high, that they might make good God led prudent decisions for the care of our children. God, that you might season their hearts with patience and compassion as they listen to the heart cry and concerns of parents and others who are responsible for the care of our children. God, that you might give them the wisdom and insight when it comes to financial matters to show them how to manage what they have as you create streams of revenue to do other things that are needed. God, that you might give them the power, the patience, and the peace and intuitive decision-making ability to incite fire back into the hearts of teachers who may be frustrated. God, that you might help them, help us all, that we might work as a community, not just to raise our children, but to empower them to be the future leaders of tomorrow. Father, we do not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds our tomorrow. And we ask, oh God, as you brought us all here, as you brought us away from our families, that you smile on those who are, whose families are represented, that you cover their families as they lend themselves in service to this city's children and as they impart their time, their talent, and their resources to make a better Montgomery by building up its most important resources, God, that you might let your light shine on our city, that our kids might shine for you. It's in the mighty, miraculous, awesome, magnificent name of the one who was, the one who is, and the one who's sure to come, our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 for high school students that gives them the opportunity to gain recognition and scholarships. About 1.6 million students nationwide take the qualifying test each year and only 16,000 make the cut. So this is a very elite group of scholars. And Principal Munson is now going to introduce those students. Good evening, thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Um, I want to take a minute to Acknowledge our nine students here and tell you how excited and proud we are of each and one of each and every one of your accomplishments today. Uh, and these students will all be proceeding on to the finalist competition for national merit, which will be determined in the spring semester. At this time, when we call your name, I'd like for you to step out and receive your certificate. <laughs> Jung Bin So. <laughs> Dane Yee. Daniel Choi, 
you. And Arnaud Guha. Congratulations. Let's give them one more round of applause. Mr. Salter, would you have any parents and friends to stay in, please? Sure, absolutely. Do we have any parents or relatives? Go ahead, go ahead. Be proud. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you all. Tom. Sir. Just for the record, I'd like to point out that two of these recipients were named Lee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm related. <laughs> well, I'm going to claim Arnav. I've been like his tennis mom mm -hmm. since he was in seventh grade. So he's also quite an awesome tennis player as well as a, a, a solid today. When you can claim Arnav, I want to claim Arnav and then son you. They play tennis with Austin. So it's That's good right. to see you guys. seen some of the students that you're about to see again. We'll have Sergeant First Class Michael Walker and the Carver JROTC Cadet. Please come back in. storming a hill somewhere, uh, but uh, we will congratulate them in extension. Sergeant Walker, of course, is the Carver High JROTC instructor, and his cadets won multiple awards recently in a statewide competition in Huntsville. In fact, the Carver JROTC um, uh, troop was the overall winner of the Lee New Century High School Drill Competition. In addition, the cadets won the five individual first place trophies, dual first place, and five other first and second place medals. They were also the overall winners in the unarmed division. So let's join the, join the board, please, in congratulating them, and we'll get their support. <laughs> All right, next we'd like to recognize a group that is certainly no stranger to school board recognition, the Brutech Robotics Department and teacher Steve Ballard. Here we go. Come right on in, ladies and gentlemen. Come right in. You can do it, though, that's fine. Come right on in. Nobody needs to see me anyway. Come on in. The Brutech Robotics students, these Brutech Robotics students, won four awards at the Gulf Shores Middle School Box on the Beach Tournament including the overall winner of the tournament. Brutech won both tournament champion awards, the design award, and the judges award for special recognition. Among the winners are Faith Smith, Tiara Jackson, Julia Fromm, and Alexa Caldwell. The team won both the tournament champion and the judges award. The team of Eric Johnson, Guy Nudo, and Jerma I'm sorry, Jamari Karam won the other tournament champion award. And finally, the team of Chris Johnson, Brett Tolerson, Carlos Ricardo, and Charlie Longmire won the Design Award. So let's please congratulate them. And of course, Steve Ballard. The of the, of the uh, wonderful robotics and engineering, and I think he does plumbing, and I don't know what I'm all over. I'm doing plumbing, okay, I'm pretending. And Steve, let's get, if you don't mind, if you'll come around here and get the certificates, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Give them to each of their. Okay, each of them. Now, yes, please, sure. Come around here. All right, pardon me. Mr. Ballard, was one of the teams that won without an all ladies team? Right here. Yeah. 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 Qualified for the state championship, but we have two other teams coming on board, and we're trying to get them 
qualify. We're going out to Auburn Spooky on the Beach. I mean, Spooky on the Plains Saturday. So, Alexa, here we go. Carlos, come up and get on. Sorry. Moms, dads, you're more than welcome to come take a picture if you want to do that. Chris. students and our employees. 
Whereas October is Czech Heritage Month, Italian American Heritage Month, National Bullying Prevention Month, National Hispanic Heritage Month, National Principals Month, and contains National School Bus Safety Week, National School Lunch Week, National Character Counts Week, International Walk to School Day, and Red Ribbon Week, which is hard to say. Therefore, the Montgomery County Board of Education does recognize the importance of each of these events and encourages our students and staff to celebrate these events and embrace the culture of all our children and employees. That symbolic resolution is dated today, October 23rd, 2018. So there's a lot of wonderful stuff going on out there in recognition of these uh, months and weeks. And we have one other thing we have to do, and that's we have to sing. Is everybody feeling like <laughs> a good voice? I know Val's a good voice, everybody's a good voice. Because today is Miss Friar's birthday. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Miss Friar's, okay? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Communications must be respectful. 
Discussing specific student or employee matters will not be allowed. Individuals who have concerns that are inappropriate to be solved in this venue are welcome to seek a problem solving meeting with the superintendent. Immediate feedback by the board may not be provided. However, you may be contacted for follow up by the superintendent or designee. Public comments may not exceed five minutes. The citizen comments may not exceed three minutes. The board chairman has full authority to terminate the remarks of any person whose comments contain personal attacks, exceed the time limit, or are otherwise inappropriate. A speaker may be considered disruptive who continues to speak when their allotted time has ended, when asked to stop speaking by the board chairman or is otherwise inappropriate. If a person fails to comply when asked to terminate comments, he or she will be escorted to their seat out of the auditorium and or off MPS property depending on the level of disruption. As far as citizen comments, citizens may sign up for comments before the board meeting. Citizens' comments must be on agenda items. Forms of citizen comments will be available 30 minutes before regularly scheduled board meetings. Agenda topics to be addressed must be identified on the form in order to speak. Individual citizen comments may not exceed three minutes. A total of 30 minutes are allotted for all citizen comments. Communications must be respectful. Discussing specific student or employee matters will not be allowed. Individuals who have concerns that are inappropriate to be solved in this venue are welcome to seek a problem solving meeting with the superintendent. I've read all that. The board reserves the right to remove all disruptive visitors from meeting. A copy of the procedures for the Montgomery County Board of Education is available online. Thank you for your participation. Okay, we'll start with Ms. Katie Brown. Whiteboards and some general maintenance issues, holes in the walls, 
what is the plan for meeting these deficiencies? Number four, does Goodwin Campus have the capacity to safely accommodate the student's body estimated at 850 for the drills and the weather events of the other emergencies form? Number five, what happened to the teachers from Georgia Washington? Why didn't they report the good ones with the students? Thank you. And I'll give each and every one a copy. Ms. Boyer, are you a parent? Yes, I am. My daughter's back. I'm sure I appreciate your question. and to recognize suicidal tendencies and be ready to intervene. 
I hope and pray that no other children will take their own lives because of bullying. This problem is serious. And we as parents and administrators need to work together to find a solution to stop bullying in our school system. Thank you for providing this opportunity to address my concerns. Ms. Monique, I want to thank you for coming in and, and, and saying that. I am so sorry to hear about your son. I'm so sorry to hear about young, it, it just keeps getting younger. I think there's a lot of people in this room that I know that remember a 13 year old here in this city doing it in the lakes. It's, it's across the board. And I as a board member cannot assure you that teachers are trained. It is my number one fight other than student achievement. And I have barked and barked and I'll continue barking. And I, I, we've got other things like uh, Daryl Bailey trying to help. There are telephone numbers that these kids can text. And I hope other parents and children actually listen to what you're saying. I can't thank you enough for coming in. Thank you. And Ms. Monique, thank you so much. I think the mic is on for you. But I remember how touched I was to hear your story. I mean, I have children that are close to your children's age. And I I can't, you know, no, I can't assure anything, but I'll say we are working really hard to get services in place as fast as we can to help those students who are victims of bullying and even getting help for children who are the bullies because we don't want this cycle to continue. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. I've seen, I'm pretty much following you on Facebook because that's how much your story has touched me and I, and I know how children just don't know how to process things. And unfortunately, your sons chose a different uh, alternative and um, but we still, we just don't know when the next child is going to choose that same path. But I promise that, uh, and I hate to say promise, but I'm gonna, as long as I'm on the board, work to make sure that we're not, we're not going to lose children like that. But I, trust me, I sympathize with my kids. Thank you. And she does work with you. Uh, Ms. Janice Brooks, with concerns about substitutes, buses, etc. Denise Brooks, not you. Okay, we'll go on to citizens' comments. I have Kenneth Watt, uh, okay, and uh, Kenneth, uh, Superintendent um, Moore, has let me know that you cannot speak tonight because your your subject matter, parent engagement, is not on the agenda tonight. So. And, and I'll tell you this, if you'll call me or get my number or look Google me, I'll tell you how to get on there. Okay. Uh, and that, 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 that completes our citizens' comments. Okay, item number seven on the agenda is we will receive as information A through, A through L. And we'll read, I'll read them. Is it, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, is that where we added one? start with the 2017 audit report with the Alabama Department of Examiners for Public Accounts. Good evening, everyone. My name is Teresa Dickel. I'm with the Examiners for Public Accounts. We work for the uh, we're a state agency where we audit every county and city board of education in the state. I'm going to have with me Brittany Little and Brooke Moore, who actually performed the audit. In accordance with the provisions of Act Number 2006-196, commonly referred to as the School Fiscal Accountability Act, we are here to present the audit report for the Montgomery Board for the period of October 1, 2016 through September 30, 2017. We conducted our audit in accordance with the applicable accounting requirements, which include generally accepted accounting principles, generally accepted auditing, auditing standards, government auditing standards, and uniform guidance. We issued an unmodified opinion on the board's financial statements as of the fourth period in September 30th, 2017. What this means is that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. 
We also noted no matter to indicate that the board had not complied in all material respects with the applicable laws and regulations. We did, however, note the following matters and include them as audit findings. They are summarized as follows. Finding number 2017-1 relates to the board's failure to hold at least two open public hearings pertaining to the proposed annual budget between July 1 and October 1. The board also did not hold its hearings, the board did not hold its hearings until January 31st and February 1st of 2017. Also, the board is required to submit an annual budget to the State Department of Education by October 1. The board did not submit its budget for the 2017 fiscal year until February 1, 2017. Finally, the board is required to publish the receipts and disbursements of the fiscal year in a newspaper in the month of October. The board failed to do this. The next finding was 2017-2. The board failed to comply with certain aspects of the public works law during the audit period. At Danley Elementary School, the board failed to obtain a bid bond, a performance bond, and a payment bond with a bid. Also, the board failed to ensure the final notice of completion by a contractor, which was published prior to the 30-day completion notice requirement. Finding number 2017-3 relates to the board's failure to ensure Goodwin Middle School followed adequate internal controls, policies, and procedures of the board. A separate audit will soon be released related to this finding. These are unresolved prior audit findings. They're listed by year number. Finding 2016-1 relates to the purchases being made prior to the purchase order being approved at Park Crossing High School. Finding 2016-7 relates to the board's failure to reconcile the central office's bank accounts in a timely manner. Finding 2016-8 relates to the board's failure to report all accounts receivables and accounts payable at year end. Finding 2016-3, the board has failed to perform an annual physical inventory of capital assets since 2013. Finding 2011-3 relates to inadequate supporting documentation for disbursement of funds at Chisholm Elementary, LAMP, MPAC, and Park Crossing High School. Finding 2009-1 at Chisholm Elementary, LAMP, MPAC, and Park High Schools, teachers failed to remit monies collected to the bookkeeper in a timely manner. For the fiscal year 17, the board's major federal financial assistance programs were the Special Ed Program and the Child Nutrition Program. We issued an unmodified opinion on those two programs we tested, so that means that there were no findings related to those two federal programs. We've included recommendations in our audit report to correct the findings presented, and the superintendent prepared a corrective action plan, which is listed at Exhibit 16 in our audit report. Our audit report was released on our website on September 28, 2018. There you can find a detailed listing of all the findings I gave you before. <coughs> our website is www.examiners.alabamaspelledout.gov. Are there questions? Most of these things that you have uh, talked about was under the auspices of Jason Taylor, and I'd like for the, your report to reflect that. Um, I know you don't do that, but I'm saying that if we want to stay in attention, Jason Taylor was the person in charge, and we can't report out what we don't have, and we didn't have that. So it needs to be understood that this is on the state intervention. Yes, yeah, I, I, I believe the superintendent pointed that out in her corrective action plan. That's it's made to the public in our in our print out report. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, you've talked about that a bit. I have a question. Is what what y'all audit? Is it just the budget and stuff like that? That's it. The financial track. The financial. Track. All federal programs and your local schools. We look at receipts and disbursements. Everything from there. But you don't. Uh, the, the, the head of personnel had told me last week or a couple of about a month ago that. They were audited, and that's why, or on, on some audits, that only principals could do the hiring. Mm -hmm. And I've checked, so y'all, I just want to know what group audited and said that they couldn't do that. Because when I checked, I found out that that's not true. No, I don't think that is true. That could have been someone from the hiring. state level, the State Department of Education. We but you said it's not true, you're audited or not. You said you don't think that is true. I don't think that's true. I don't think it either. relies upon your policies and procedures that you have in place. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true. Chairman, please be reminded that well, that's, I just want to make sure because I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. Because okay. okay. so, so, so far I hadn't found the horse that has the mouth that says that is so can we, the way it's supposed to be. Okay, because that's a person now. So can we go to the next item, please? That's a challenge. Thank you. 
2018 August financial statement, Ms. Crawford Watt. Ms. Rowe, I just needed clarification. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice President, members of the board, Madam Superintendent. You should have before you the financial statement for the month of August of 2018. As you know, fiscal year runs from um, October 1st through September 30th. Therefore, <coughs> August represents the 11th month of the fiscal year. Therefore, we have one more month left to report for fiscal year 2018. Of course, we projected um, in the budget hearing uh, a month or so ago that we'll end fiscal year 2018 with about $18 million. Well, Madam Vice President, I am somewhat happy to say that we're looking more closer now at possibly around $21 million that we think we'll end fiscal year 2018. So instead of $18 million, then we're looking at possibly $21 million. However, we're still working on uh, completing our financial statements for 2018. It has to be reported to the state in November. We intend to meet those deadlines. And uh, again, uh, additional two to three million dollars in our fund balance of uh, certainly help. Where did that come from? Because I know the last time you came up there, we had a nine million deficit. Well, that, that's what we, I'm projecting a nine million dollar deficit. That's for 2019. Oh, I got you. 2018. Okay. I got you. Okay. Yes. Um, as it relates to the to the, 20, the August 2018 financial statement, you should have in your book. I'm not going to bore you going through all those nine items like I did during the budget hearing. So, but you should have an explanation of financial data, speaking mainly of the general fund, which is the primary primary source. Um, you also should have a snapshot analysis as part of your financial statement. It provides financial information and just more of a general snapshot of the general operations of the district for the month of August. You also should have the combined financial statements, um, mainly the general fund. All those two uh, major financial statements, the combined balance sheet, which pretty much speaks of the district's financial position of a given period. Again, uh, we're projecting the end fiscal year 2018 with about a $21 million fund balance comparable to what we projected a few months ago of $18 million. You also should have uh, in this packet uh, the, the combined statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund balance. That's more so an income statement in private industry, which basically lists our revenues and our expenditures and the changes in fund balance. Also, you should have the definition of accounting terms. This just pretty much just provides the board more of a definition chart of what some of those terms means. Also, a check register accountability report, which lists all of the checks that the district printed in the month of August. Uh, Madam, President, Mr. Madam Vice President, this information is also posted on the district's website. So if the public or anyone wants to ever view this information, uh, they're welcome to go on the website and to view that information. <coughs> Madam Vice President. Mr. Watts, I am so proud of the work that you have been able to step in. You came into a mess, and I do appreciate what you've done. I, I like your explanation that you have given us, and the one thing that I like the most is that all bank statements have been reconciled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Watts, I did have one question. Something popped out to me. I was looking at the, um, um, let me see if I can find it. It was the, um, I think it was the local revenue coming in. No, I'm looking at it. The county um, Avalon. I noticed that there was a decrease. It's, um, well, it's not. A lot of a lot of times it's usually a timing issue. Sometimes those those taxes come in at different times during the month, or sometimes they may they may come in the very next month. So it's usually a timing issue as it relates to uh, what it comes in. That's also, um, I guess he left before he started talking about adding more taxes, so 
convenient, but um, if we do, <coughs> like Ms. Smith said, in 2017 fiscal year, like the district regular Adjuan 3 mil, $369,000, and for fiscal year 2018, it's 144, so that's less than half. That's correct. And again, that could be timing as well. Okay. Uh, and it's really based on when those taxes are collected and remitted uh, to the district. And sometimes they're remitted a little bit faster, sometimes not. So, okay. But we do make accruals at the end of the accounting period uh, for any monies that we have not received as of September 30th. So we'll make an accrual for that to recognize those revenues. Okay. Arthur, could I ask some questions about some checks? Sure. You have this information here that we have? Yes, sir. Okay, go to page two of 22. Got $14.17 for Andre Harrison, who works with Advanced Ed. Can't he buy his own hamburgers? <laughs> I don't, as much money as we pay in for that, I, I don't get it. Then we got $25,000 for Second Chance Foundation. What is the Second Chance Foundation? Somebody can tell me that. It's a program for students that have been uh, suspended from among other public schools. They go to the Second Chance Program. All right, what is the board of, of a board of school commissioners? Board of school? I would have to look at that. Uh, of course, Mr. Mr. Lee, if you were to point those out to me, then I can bring the information back because it's a number of checks, hundreds of checks that we print each month, and I'll certainly bring that information back to you. If you could just list those checks for me and bring them to me, and I could, I could certainly bring them back. Well, to us. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, I would recommend that we highlight the areas and allow Dr. Moore and her staff to do different directives, touch different Department where those checks and those purchase orders comes from. So I'm gonna ask that you would highlight those specific items <coughs> and more on our staff to collect that information for you. Madam Vice Chair. May I ask one question, please? I noticed on the checkbook that a lot of the explanations it said other objects. What does that mean? If you look on page towards the back, uh, I believe it's on page 21. <coughs> well, now hold on a minute, now I've lost it. But I just noticed that. type of purchase services. Okay. In, in our accounting manual, there are thousands of accounting codes, and, and to list every single one of them would be uh, quite a task. But even on these particular ones, on these particular checks, certainly we can provide more detail on those if you, if you like, so you can provide that to the superintendent, and we'll be more than happy to provide the backup. We, we would, because I'll tell you, I mean, when you're paying out $6,481 and 26, thousand four hundred twenty one and just calling it other objects it's, it's concerning right and of course these codes these are not codes that we make up these are codes that are provided by uh the state department of education but certainly we have the backup the backup every single check that we write and we'll be more than happy to provide that information i think we need to get that certainly if, if you can provide them with the you know whatever checks to the superintendent will be more than happy to provide it for you all right, a couple, couple more things. Definitely all the other objects. I'd just like to know what they were. Okay. Sure. What really jumped out at me is travel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <coughs> my math shows we spent almost $92,000 on travel in August. Well, what I, what I would just say to that, that there is professional development that takes place throughout the district. What we have done for fiscal year 2019, we provided every single department a copy of their departmental budget. And we intend to make sure that, that everyone um, is pretty much held to their budget. Now some of those budgets will include some professional development. Of course, professional development is approved uh, by various levels. 
and some professional development people require uh, by state. So, so does this also, Mr. Watts, um, have information? Is this the item where, say, a psychologist might travel from one school to another or to uh, provide services it, it, throughout the district? And so they're having to move around, and there are other people yes. who have to move around from one area to the other. And so when they do that, we do um, reimburse. Yes, we reimburse those employees based on the state or federal rate that the federal government provides us, which I think is about 50 cents per hour. Well, what is the 15000 to Crown Plaza or Yeah, that was my next well, that, that would be something, again, I will, we'll, re, we'll look at that. That's a check that. Of course, we'll, we'll, we'll pull the documentation and we'll provide that information to you. So, uh, Dr. Moore, Dr. Moore, yeah. I just wanted to, before, right before the state intervention, our attorney was, I was working with her to um, update our policy on travel because professional development is very important. But we also know that it has become um, quite quite plus customary for people to wait to the last minute to register so they don't get the place where the um, event is being held and they get the more expensive rooms. And so we've got to have a policy um, to keep that from ha happening because we've had some people taking advantage of I'm so concerned anybody, I don't think anybody that works in education needs to stay at the Crown Plaza. Yeah. So Mr. Watts, um, you might want to talk to them about what we just recently had a conversation sure. about, or I will do it, whichever. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, that actually is the topic of conversation that we had recently regarding um, how to manage travel. Um, uh, the per diem rate that we've been giving rather than actual, that at some point we'll go to a per diem um, to ask that we get information in in a timely manner so that uh, wherever you are happening, have to, wherever you happen to have lodging, that it meets um, the, the standards that we put together. So that is a conversation I recently had with the staff about how we're going to put that out in writing so that everybody understands how that works and that it's not as loose as it may have been in the past. Also, the other thing I think that will help is that this year we worked with um, Mr. Watts, I call him Sir Arthur, because he's really good at putting things together, doing his job. And so uh, we worked also on giving departments a budget in writing so they know exactly what they have in their budget line items. We've asked them not to spend necessarily everything that's in there, but it does give them some guidance on how much they might be able to use in that particular line item. So all of that is let me say, in the works. Good. And so we're trying to pull all that together because we do see it as an area that we need to improve upon. And, and so, I, and I just want to remind okay. everyone, since I see a lot of our directors and so forth here, that we've also requested that the, that we can reduce those budgets by at least 30% for this year's year for 20, 2019. So just want to make that statement also. So. And Mr. Watts, one other thing about the mega conference, that's just the in and out kind of thing. We, can, we spend it, but we get it back, right? So the various vendors of how, does that still work the same way with the mega conference? It, it does. For the most part, uh, only mega conference, most of these things are paid with federal, with federal funds. Right. Where uh, principals have their own budget, mm -hmm. Title I budget, and usually they do budget for some of these workshops out of their federal dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily coming out of the general fund. Right. All of it's not coming out of the general fund. And also, to I don't know if this is part of what you're asking, but sometimes we are a flow through right. for the state department, and so they will will right. sign off on something, right. and then they reimburse or they take care of it. But the contract actually comes through MPS in this case. You still have those checks, so that right, the check right. still will be missing on our check register because we need to process those checks. Arthur, thank you. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm just tired. Oh, we're well, uh, welcome. It's okay. And also, board members, if you, you know, when you see things that you want to ask more questions about, when it becomes very, very specific, um, staff may not have that in front of them, but they'll be happy to adjust and ask, answer your questions as much as possible. 
if you can send it. Please put it. We had a lot tonight. So if you put those in writing, uh, then we'll make sure Mr. Watts gets those so that he can cover that for you. Okay. Next is the Montgomery Sugar donation. 150 books at elementary school. Uh, we have uh, uh, we've offered also our 
<coughs> graduation in the spring for the students. Um, we've also, I went to our dean of our library and asked him, can our students check out, can BTW students check out books? He said yes, he said as long as they had ID cards. So we're willing to make up special BTW, AUM, ID cards for the students. So not only they can go to the library, but they can check out books during this time. And we have other studios and rooms that are available. So, so from AUM, uh, I know later on in the agenda that uh, you have a, a, a MOU uh, to consider. Uh, I encourage you to consider approving that to help the students uh, from, from BTW. And at this time, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Godwin for a few words. So thank you for the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, we appreciate your time. We're just trying to be there to get the students the resources that they need as, as in a timely manner as we can make that happen. Uh, and then offer any kind of support to the faculty as well and the staff at BTW just to get them back on track and moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Wickleman, do we have any um, additional questions? In your folder, you have the BTW calendar from January until May, and you'll see that it's basically a full calendar. And we need facilities to make provision for our students as well as our faculty. Also, there is a historical piece because I received a number of questions regarding the BTW facilities, and the date is on 2005. And it goes into detail why we're going to need access to AUM for the type of work that our students and our staff members um, will complete at BTW. And I just want to say in closing, I had the opportunity to speak to one of my colleagues in Georgia, and he said that I am a Steinway school, so I have about five Steinway pianos. And all of my students get a free instrument. And I would love to see that wonderful work happening at MPS, but Auburn University, Montgomery, that's my five Steinway pianos, and that is also the equivalent, if not more, of all of our students having an instrument, because they have the instrument of being on a college campus and having the beautiful resources that Dr. Stockton, Mrs. Winkleman, and so many other Daryl Morris, uh, they're providing for us. Any questions? I, I want to thank you, Dr. Stockton, Dr. Stockton and, and Ms. Wickleman for reaching out. This is this is a far beyond you need the call of anything. It just it says a lot to us as board members, a lot to our students. Um, I'm a graduate of AUM, and I, I, I'm just so pleased to see my alma mater do something. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Technology Magnet Rental Agreement, Mr. Jason Owen. <laughs> Madam Superintendent, Mr. Roller, Lord, um, I am here to represent Free Tech High School uh, in presenting the contract for our graduation May 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, at the Impact Theater. Uh, Impact has provided us a, a very dignified graduation ceremony. They provide us uh, with extra security. There are a few doors, so we were able to secure the location, and they were able to, with a last minute um, security threat that we felt we had last year, we were able to provide extra security along with extra metal detectors. This is a place that Brutec has graduated from the previous 10 years, I believe. Uh, I know the last five uh, that I've been an administrator there, and uh, we would like to continue having our uh, graduation at this facility. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Next, we have the River Region Psychiatry LLC, Dr. Kathleen Lee. Good evening. We have a partnership with River Region Psychiatry. 
history that the city provides our district psychiatric services to MPA students. Uh, we were able to expand our partnership mm -hmm. over last year so that he is able to serve uh, any school within the district. Uh, Dr. Saini provides those services at FUSE. He has residents at FUSE two days per week so that he sees children for the entire day on both of those Mondays per month. And Dr. Saini provides those services in our district for a 12 month period. So uh, our children within MPS can receive the services and, and medical supports that they need without having to leave outside of the district. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, next we have Mr. Tom Salter for the 2019-20 calendar, school calendar. Good evening, again. Um, thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, in all of your packets, you should have a copy of the proposed <coughs> calendar for 2019-2020. I also had copies out here for the uh, folks who joined us um, here. Um, the calendar is fairly straightforward. We've made a couple of changes from this year's calendar. Uh, we're actually starting with, with this calendar was accepted. would actually start on the same day that we started for this year. Uh, we did uh, reduce the number of service days by one. Uh, before we had proposed a service day in April, but we had one in April, but that's been removed. Um, there are 180 calendar days, which is the same as this year. That's now a requirement of the State Department of Education. In the past, we were able to adjust our days somewhat by the number of hours of instruction, but now it's, it's limited to 180 days. It has seven days for teacher in-service professional development. Uh, we also have uh, 240 days for our 12-month employees, which is our contract link. Do you have any questions or? I have a comment, Mr. Madam Chairman. Um, thank you for July 31st not being on here. I got a lot of phone calls. You're welcome. And I know you and I talked extensively about, you know, the teachers having that input yes, so that they can uh, be satisfied. We want to satisfy them. That's what keeps them with us. And uh, so thank you on that, on, on adjusting that. That's my only comment. The, the teachers did have two weeks to look over the, uh, the calendars and provide a number of of exciting comments for them about it. So uh, but the one, <laughs> the one thing I know I've known for the 13 years I've done this is I'm going to make everybody unhappy. So um, we, we do the best we can. And Dr. Moore took the recommendations from the calendar committee uh, and went over those. And this is between the recommendations of the calendar, commi calendar committee and the feedback from teachers. This is what we talked about. And it will now sit out for 30 days. Well, actually, it's going to be more than that. We're going to bring it back to you in December, along with any public comments. Uh, tomorrow morning, this will be put on the website, along with ways that anybody can make comments about it. And Madam Chair and Board, I'd like to ask Tom to transition it back to a seat. I'd like to just take this opportunity to um, highlight the fact that the communication that he demonstrated and sharing information with them faculty and staff and getting the input is one of the things that we've been focusing on throughout the advanced ed process on improving. It was one of the things that they called for. And I think the comments that you guys have received from the teachers are indicative of the work that Tom and the staff and the, and the teams are doing to improve that communication. Madam Chair. Okay. Next time you'll be talking about the Monsignor West Beverly School. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, this is a contract that has no cost. It was part of the original um, agreement we had with our website company, but because they, uh, they farm out this portion of the, of the website task, then we have to approve the separate contract, although there's no money associated with it. And what this tool does is it helps us stay in compliance with the federal government and the laws governing um, uh, <coughs> handicap accessibility and other items that is uh, associated with our website. All 
Good, you can hurry on. Are you speaking for both? You and Lee? I probably can. Lee's there to protect me. I put a brief PowerPoint together in a few slides. We're looking at the trains, maintenance plan, and just to give you an idea of what the scope of work that they would be involved in uh, with HVAC inspections, providing a chiller technician, a commercial technician to provide our boiler maintenance, and then also our filters and filter replacements. The main thing in, in all of this is to make sure we create a good, clean, safe environment that you know, provides a comfortable place for the students. And then also, you know, with our last year safe inspection, they recommended that we have annual boiler maintenance. So that's something that we provide. With those systems, they're highly combustible, so we want to make sure we have highly trained people to, to be involved in, in maintaining those boilers next cycle. <laughs> And then the preventative maintenance, you know, what we want to do with preventative maintenance is, of course, <coughs> avoid cost and extra cost in the breakdown of the system. Because when you, when you have an HVAC or boiler, any of those things go down and it breaks down, instead of properly maintaining it along the way, it creates extra cost. This is also a U.S. Community Service Group. And meaning that, that means that there is a third party that looks over their contract to make sure that the prices and the things and services that they're providing meet a service standard throughout the country. And it's a, uh, they're, they're not going, as it was described to me, train is not going to take a chance in the millions and billions of dollars that they spend around the country over one service contract here. They're going to meet some of their standard throughout the country with what they do. So there is a third party that reviews this contract and makes adjustments to that to make sure it's a fair uh, price, you know, according to service standards in the last one. And just to give you an idea here in the summary of it, if you look down there at the bottom, our boiler maintenance runs approximately, that these are the year end from what last year's 2017-18 prices that were coming through. The boiler maintenance was about $150,000. The HVA services was over $800,000. Our filter maintenance was $100,000, which totals over a million dollars. The maintenance agreement that we're looking at today will take all of those things under one umbrella and uh, provide those services at $912,000. A little bit of change there. And then the immediate projected cost savings there is $161,000. They're also providing us, if you look there up top, and that, <coughs> that we should see somewhere between a 12 to 18 percent uh, reduction in cost over the initial year with a one to two percent uh, savings each additional year after that up to you know a certain amount of those things and with our aging hva systems and things that are going on in our schools the better we can maintain these things the, the better service that we'll get and we'll save money over the long haul yes ma'am you might be the one that uh, I'm not putting you on the spot, but how, what, what, what funding source does that payment come out of? Most of it came out of general, general fund. Okay. And this is not above and beyond the projected budget that Mr. Watts has given us. This is what is coming out of the maintenance budget okay. that he's provided for us this year. I, I, I have some problems. I'm looking at your assigned team. You got five people here. You got account manager, account engineer, service technician, engineer, energy engineer, and area service manager. And I'm looking at the initial term, and we're talking to be about a five year contract that's going to be four and a half million dollars. And if if we had this for as long as we've had it, and we've had a lot of work that's been done on our boilers and, and services that were provided, and I just, I don't see us doing a five-year contract where we don't even know if we have money to, to even have a H, uh, HVAC service in the bill. It's, it's something about this contract that really bothers me and uh, it's been bothering me ever since we started several years ago and to me 
things, uh, and I went back and researched some of the information that I had, and I don't see where it's such a big savings when we have custodians and we have people that are working year round. <laughs> to me, this seems to be a lot of money for five years. I mean, you all, you're talking about a million dollars a year just to keep the ball of and if they are really doing what they say or what they're charging us to do, we should wait. I mean, we should know about this until the end where it's almost in a situation where it's nothing we can do about, about it but replace it. If you're doing this type of service for us during the year, why do we wait until it gets so that we can't do anything about it but replace? I don't, I don't see the maintenance here, and maybe because I've been on here ever since we started with the trains. Is it any way possible that, and I look at the number of people that are hired, you know, it's almost like you got somebody to wait on somebody else to get a job done. And that it's leaving our custodians out. And a lot of them, I know Mr. Curtis, I think that's his name. Uh -huh. He can do anything, almost what these people are doing. I, it's, it's something that bothers me and I can't put my hands on it. Have we tried to check and see if we could get a contract that would be better than this or a contract we would have to sign off over five years? Five years is a long time. Yes, and we can look at the at the yearly agreement. The these are the things that we're already servicing these these areas right here. This is what we're currently spending, had to spend to maintain what we have. And I remember when they first started this. Uh, I think it's I can't think of Jason's lesson, but anyway, they were talking about Jason's this is a but what, what I was looking at, I mean, if we have leadership in these buildings, I don't think we need to pay somebody this kind of money to tell the principals to tell the teachers to cut the air conditioners off. <laughs> that, and that's not what this is. This is this is going into the school. Well, when they first started out, that's what they were saying. They were going to teach our leadership. Train. I went back and looked at all my paperwork. So if I, if I know, you can just tell me. But I, I really think that uh, almost five million dollars that we're going to sign a contract for five years for almost five million dollars. I just personally, I just have a problem with this. Yes, ma'am. I mean, we're we're going to spend more than that in five years here with what we're currently That's, having to do. How do you know you're going to? You don't know what you're going to do next year. This is what based on what you have done in the past. If we're still replacing these things, then why would we have to replace? I, I just don't see the amount of money that we're paying for this. And I, I would personally like to see us kind of uh, scout around and see what we're doing. Because just because we started out with this company and they're paying consultants to consult the consultants, I, I just well, they, they, they aren't, they aren't consultants. These are, these are technicians going in. Well, you got managers. So that's that's going to be their office that will. So we're paying to help them run their company, don't you think? No, we're, we're paying for technicians, the technicians that I put on there, we're paying for them to work in our school system. They're going to maintain And our, who do they report to? <coughs> well, even to the minus one. This is supplemental to what we're already doing. We're so we're our, paying almost $5 million for supplemental Supplementary, we're it's having, not even the base. We're, we're having to do in our current status with the technicians that we got, we can't get to all the work. So we have to contract that. And this is this supplements that. Do we have to sign a five year contract? No. I mean, I just don't see, I mean, we don't even know. We could got to get some Chromebooks or some uh, uh, smart boards or some other things. I guess this bothers me, and it has bothered me ever since we started this contract. And you know, I've talked to you, Mr. Rudolph, about this, but that's that's my personal issue, and I don't know if anybody else on the board feels the same way, but I just think we can do, we can get a better price than this, and I, I don't, 
I don't look into sign a five-year contract with anybody. And with regard to things like charter, mm -hmm. it does not have to be five years. It can be one year, two, three. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he did some data to show if this is really working. You sign a five-year contract, whether it's working or not, you got five-year contracts. And Madam President, if I may address <coughs> President Sorry. Um, I will tell you one of my concerns. Um, just having a bid tabulation to see who else could, you know, offer us some similar effective services, but maybe at a more reasonable rate. The price is pretty alarming, and I'm now hearing the history behind Train and that makes it even more concerning. That heightens, you know, my antennas a little bit more. I just want to know if we can just get a, a bid tabulation just. And that, and that was prior what whatever yeah. happened before. I just know in our relationships that I've been in in my short time, right. those guys are answering tons of orders, work orders for us at this point. And that's part of the, one of the things that finance likes so much about the U.S. Community Services is that is that's a third party group outside of MTS and training that looks at that contract to help make sure that it's on industry standards so that it, it doesn't go over a budget of what they allow. And to our knowledge with Lee and, and talking to Lee, because that was my sticker shock was, was big for me. Yeah, it but it was, there is no other group in the area that, that can you provide the that. service. Yes, you know that. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Ms. Madam President, if I may address Mr. Watson, that's okay. Mr. Weiss, is this, financially feasible for us. I think it is, and of course we did budget for it. What I'm more concerned about, <clears throat> when we're talking about these HVAC and boiler systems, that if we do not uh, provide this type of preventive maintenance, I've seen a, a, a HVAC system uh, not get that service, and then you have to purchase one, you're talking about six or $700,000 <coughs> for, for one shot at one school. So it is technical services uh, from a certified, these certified technicians, uh, that provide these type of services. As to whether we have folk on our staff or enough people on our staff that can provide this, I can't answer that. But I do know how critical it is to provide these type of preventive maintenance services. Because I have seen where boilers and some of these things could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars if they're not served correctly. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we got a lot of old schools. In general, what would you say the condition of all that infrastructure is <coughs> great shape or it's medium or alarming. I mean, it's it's something that if, if we can get a handle with a with a great preventative maintenance and start setting a plan for capital outlay on these type of projects, roofs, HVACs, that's what we've got to do. If we can if we can save one hundred and sixty one thousand dollars a year. In that and, and even more with the 30 percent that we're looking at trying to cut from each of our budgets my goal is to try to put money towards <coughs> capital projects to take care of these things we have two at jeff davis that we are looking at currently for capital projects at about a million and a half dollars for just two hvacs there uh, you have roofs uh, all around the system that need to be replaced and we really need to look at this we, but we've got to put a maintenance plan in place that we're not waiting until something breaks in order to come in and fix it because then it costs more and if we can maintain it properly then we'll, we'll save money on not only on this but energy and the things that, it, that will go along with it as well. Ms. Burns, I know that money, that is a lot of money, but I think I just would ask you if we could do maybe a one year Contract. I think it's a data. You know, we yeah. always talk about data. Well, I agree, but I think they've already done the data, and they're saying there's nobody else out there in this area that can do that maintenance. And nobody wants to be in a hot classroom or a cold classroom. <coughs> you know, this year, and if we're saving money, $161,000. Oh, well, we've been 
working on these HBCs that Jeff Davis put in here. Since I've been on board, uh, I, I just, I have a heart for it, and as I said, I, that's personal with me. And I have talked to Mr. Rudolph and others. I just, five, a five-year contract, almost $5 million, when we're talking about how many millions uh, we are in the hole. It just, it bothers me. Madam President, if I may ask one last question. With the, and I, the concern is the, the years of the contract. And then I also heard you say that you will have a comprehensive plan in place to kind of be on top of all of the maintenance issues. Um, I guess with that being said, as things get fixed and replaced or what have you, will the cost Begin to reduce the house that work. And you should see definitely see that <coughs> as things are. My goal is to not put a band aid on things. Right. Let's fix it. Let's fix it right. Get the cost down where you can look at things and make a true plan of, as to how to attack these situations that we have with the roofs and the HVACs that are that are major issues in the signs. Okay, that's awesome. Are we out? Are we out? Band aid. Mm -hmm. Madam President, we we don't have mandates big enough. <laughs> May I clarify just to make sure I'm hearing this line correctly? So your main concern hey, is the uh, 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 I'm sorry. Hey, do we have order in the meeting, please? This is a public board meeting on behalf of the board. It's held publicly for you to be here at, but this is a public board meeting for the board. So we're gonna ask that you table your comments. We're going to have to ask that you leave. Thank you. So I want to make sure I'm hearing Ms. Brian correctly. She is more concerned about the length of the contract, the five-year piece. Yeah. Um, so we can, we can look at that. Again, the term does not have to be five years. It okay. Can one year. So we can look at reducing it possibly. Oh, one or agree. to two. I agree with that. So we can look at the numbers at the end of the year. And if, yeah. if they don't add up, definitely. Yeah. Right, and then the second thing that I think I'm hearing um, is that we're already contracting services on these, the volume maintenance, HVAC and all that. We're already doing that yes. to the tune of one point, whatever million. Yes. And that if we go with a company, this has nothing to do with our people who are in-house already that we, have, that we have on board as an employee. We're contracting for these services already currently. So that if we go with the train contract, we would reduce our costs for something that we're already doing. We're not doing away with anybody's job, per se. We're just using the company to do, and I, I'm thinking, and, and this is probably a guess, but that we probably are using more than one company to, to do these current Correct. kinds of things. And what we would be doing with training would be to move it to one company that keeps up with all of the equipment and would have a better handle on what it is that we might need. Also, to keep in mind that we have a lot of old equipment and that obsolescence is going to set in and is setting in over time, if we don't do something about maintaining what we already have, uh, we're probably going to end up replacing some things that we might not have to replace so soon. So we're not, we're already doing this with various companies. This contract with Train would be for one company to take care of everything, <coughs> hopefully based on your projection, reduce some money, and then noting what Ms. Breyer has said, that we reduce that contract so that we are able to look at it in a year or two and see if it really is as effective as we think it will be. Yes, Does that work for everybody? It works for me two okay. years. You know, let's just do two years and see how things work for us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they'll have to go back to the company to see if they will go along with a two year rather than a five year. Okay. Which is, we won't vote on that one tonight. We'll vote on it at our next meeting. Okay. Oh, that was man. Yeah. Go. Let me finish first. I was just gonna say. Oh. I know he, he's really trying to be, he's really being nice, but. Nice, but And I'm trying, I'm trying not to, 
get riled up again about the need for additional revenue. Madam Superintendent, we have a lot of old buildings, a lot of old buildings. I understand that there was some type of deferred maintenance uh, uh, review that took place several years ago, and that we had deferred maintenance over 170 some million dollars of needs needed in our school district. <coughs> there is a need for additional revenue. And I think uh, until we really address that, because it's a real problem, then I think we'll, we will continue to have the same problem. We'll continue to do what we can to fix up things the best way we can, but at some point, it, it'll be non-fixable. And we will have to put in these brand new systems that cost hundreds of millions of dollars that in which we do not have the money uh, for at this current time. So I think the real problem is, at some point, we have to look at a situation where there's additional revenue. Yes, so thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I, I, uh, I, I have to have a question, Mr. Watts. What would you? What's your personal opinion? How many? I mean, just for you to get up. How many years would you? Would you think? I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying. What's, what's your opinion? You mean on I our trust your opinion. Okay. on our structures? Uh, no, on that on the, the contract. contract. On the contract. Well, I, when I look at when I look at what we're currently expending now on an annual basis, and look at what this this organization is offering, when I see that there's a cost savings, then certainly it's something that I think is um, is more beneficial to the district. So how many? How many years? How many years would you think? What's your on the contract? Yeah. Well. The three to five years, I didn't think was, was, was that bad because I did, what I can see is that as the years go on, if we're not addressing it, I, I can see I was spending even more money each year if we continue to use each vendor independently because each vendor's going to continue to go up on their price <coughs> every single year. So, I mean, at least you would have these folks that locked in for a, for a number of years. So. And, and I didn't include the, the parts cost. That was about $500,000 last year in parts cost alone. Because that's that's a variable that could be us fixing, them fixing, that sort of thing. So I, that's some of the costs I didn't include in there as well. It's, it is a huge cost, HVAC boilers and filters in our system that we're having to do. And I, would, I want to be proactive in maintaining it instead of reactive and waiting for things to break down with that. I agree. So, Madam so Chairman, just a rough estimate on the numbers that he provided over the course of five years is approximately about eight hundred thousand. So, over the course of the five-year contract, we're saving about a million. And we're looking at a ten million dollar deficit. So, when we deploy the strategy, strategies and tactics that we're asking the the department head to do a thirty percent cut in their budgets, we're asking for them to be innovative and creative in how we use carryover and do things and. And, and move things around so that we can, within the law, try to recoup in and actualize some of the deficits that we're talking about. This is the kind of stuff that we're looking at that's outside the box to do strategies to generate revenue over time, as well as the referenda and the uuh, tax increases. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rower. I actually agree with you this time. <laughs> I'm just going to ask, and I'm just one vote, but I just ask that we keep it on the consider for approval this evening because I think we need to make, keep moving forward. I think that our staff has done due diligence, and uh, I, that's just my request. I agree. And, and I forgot to thank Mr. Rudolph, too, for looking at and vetting the contract the way he did. He really put a lot of work into into that now. I mean, it's several weeks in making sure that, that things were right for MPS. Like, thank you. Good job. Thank you. Okay, next we have Elliot of Observation Visit, District Summer Report, Ms. Kim Pitts, and Dr. Burnett. <coughs> Good evening, Madam that we talked about in the past, just so you would have um, 
a point of reference at this point since we've been working on this project since August. So, in our last board meeting, you all did ask before we presented any other contracts or anything like that. We kind of wanted to see where we are. So we met with Dr. Harrison, and he gave us an overview of everything that we've done this far, and that's what we presented to this afternoon. So just as a recap, we want to talk about what the Elliott Observation Instrument is in general. And the Elliott Observation Instrument in general is a student observation instrument. And what that does is it allows for us to look at classrooms and promote a learning center classroom. And as you're looking at that classroom, it provides data for different learning environments, and it assists with evidence gathering, and that evidence helps us determine what areas our teachers need assistance with. And when you talk about a learning center classroom, we're talking about a classroom that really kind of places the responsibility of learning in the student's hands. It allows for active learning, students solve their own problems, they work together as a group, they do research, and that research is outside and beyond what the teacher provides. It creates cooperative learning opportunities, and that um, as students are presented with challenges in real world conversations, then they're able to take that conversation and move it to the next level. And a learning center classroom allows that to happen. When we go into a classroom, and when I talk about we, I'm talking about the team of people that we went out. And each school had a team of three, four, or five people, depending on the size of the school. We looked at only the language arts block and the math block, because that's where I kind of do it. And when we look at those classrooms, we looked at seven learning environments. And that's what the Elliott tool actually looks at. Now remember, we're not evaluating teachers. We're looking at students and what they're doing in the classroom. Does that have some implication for the teacher? Of course it does. But when looking at, at, at the students, we looked at these seven. The first, is there an equitable learning environment? And when the team goes in, they have some look-fors. And we chose two look-fors that were really important under each of these. When we look at an equitable learning environment, do students all have access to some sort of support? Do they have differentiated learning opportunities, meaning that are they all doing the same thing? Are we meeting kids where they are and doing the things that they need based on where they are in their, in their educational process? The next learning environment is high expectations. <coughs> are students really engaging in activities that's going to challenge them? Do they strive to meet the teacher's high expectations? Are they, they doing those things to reach the goals that we set for them? Is the learning um, environment supportive? So when we talk about a supportive learning environment, do they take risks? Are they afraid to take risks? Are they comfortable in sharing their thoughts, opinions, and ideas without being criti criticized or critiqued, but supported in that way? Do they receive assistance from their teachers, their peers, and additional resources? Is the teacher actually facilitating those kids? Are their peers working with them to, accom to accomplish whatever standard or goal there is? Is the learning environment active? Are they engaged in discussions with teachers and other students? You know, traditionally, when I was in school, a good classroom, everybody was one. That's not the case anymore. You need to hear that there's some activity. So is the active learning environment something where you see kids engage with each other? Are they um, talking to each other? Are they doing activities? Do you see cooperative learning? Are they working with their peers and collaborating? Who do we learn best from? You have peers, right? Because that teacher, that's just a grown up up there talking. But when I can interact with my classmates, you can see that there's some learning. And as we went to these classrooms, it was awesome to see kids challenging each other's thinking. Progress monitoring, we talk a lot about that, about data and all of those things. Students respond to the feedback they get from teachers. And do they demonstrate understanding of the lesson content? content. That means is, are they actually understanding what's being taught? And are they able to share and demonstrate what we're expecting them to do? Then this one is one um, that we talk about a lot in a lot of different contexts. But we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Well-managed learning. The students speak and interact respectfully with teachers and their peers. So when they're interacting, do we see a lot of chaos? Do we see a lot of joking and poking? Or do we see kids really on 
on task and doing those things that they're supposed to do? So do they demonstrate knowledge of the lesson rules and expect expectations? We see them posted, but they, are they actually adhering to those things? Are they actually using an inside voice? Do they have cues? Do they do that with each other to keep the noise level down and making sure that the noise level is meaningful? Then digital learning. Students gather, evaluate, and use digital information. What's the first word in there? Students. <coughs> Not the teacher using the technology, but the students actually using the technology. Are they conducting research using that technology? Not what Tom is doing for us right now. If we had students doing that, that would be a, an example of that. Question. Yes. How long is the team in a room? You're right on time. Right. So first of all, the Elliott is comprised of seven environments, and I just explained those to you. Then on the Elliott too, there are 28 items that we have to actually, that we're looking for. Each observation, you have to be in there a minimum of 20 minutes. And remember, we're not in there looking at what the teacher is doing. We're actually walking around, seeing what students are doing, and we actually talk to students when we need to. If they're in small groups and on the floor, I had a very engaged group on the floor on the number line. It's great to have them on the floor on the number line, but you need to know what they're doing and they may know what they're doing. So a minimum of 20 minutes in each class. Mr. Lee, did that answer your question? Yes. 20 minutes is pretty much the time that we spend in every classroom. And you can do all of that in 20 minutes? You can. You really can. I'd like to see y'all work. <laughs> I wish you could have been on a team. When I say it was probably one of the most fun times that I've ever had, and I think most people in the team, and the team was not just um, comprised of NPS people. We had people from the State Department, we had people from Advanced Ed, we had principals, and what we're trying to do is build capacity. We're not trying to let people have to always come in and we pay them, because I heard you say something about the money we're spending paying for hamburgers or whatever the case may be. <laughs> But we're trying to build capacity. All of our principals served on one of these teams so that they can build teams back at their school and they can do these same suites. Central office personnel, they were on these teams as well. They're, they're learning to do these suites. So we will have the capacity to do these suites. Um, and we talked to Dr. Harrison again this morning and as he finished up everything, because we don't have all of the results, he has them all, um, but he finished up the last of them and he made the comment, you all are very honest about yourselves in your classrooms. He said, and that's very evident in the work that you've done. You've shown what your weaknesses are because none of us got to talk to each other. We, when we first get there, that's the only time we really talk. Um, we met and Renee, you can chime in here if I'm, if I'm not saying exactly what the exactly. process is. But when we first get there, for example, the first team I was on, I think I was the team leader, and I think I had four people, a total of four people, we go to one classroom together, we take our Elliott observations, and we go to that classroom and look for those 28 things and those seven learning environments and all of those look for we talked about. Then we go back to our meeting room and we look to see if we're, we calibrated to make sure we're all on the same page. And pretty much, other than a couple of items, we were dead on the money. Everybody pretty much saw exactly the same thing or did not see something that we should have seen. So we calibrate first. Then after that, we go out and try to individual rooms. We have some that go to math, some that went to English, and we try to get in our areas of comfort. Um, for example, I, I love the math, I do. So I wanted to go to every math classroom I could, but I also taught English. So I said, okay, I, I better do some of those too. And, and that's the way that it works. But we can do it in 15 minutes. The hard thing is really leave, because you really want to stay. Um, you want to see the lesson from beginning to end. But on the form, it tells, did you go in the room at the beginning of the lesson, at the middle of the lesson, or at the end of the lesson? Because based on the timing of the lesson, you should see different things. Do you give them a, do they get a numerical rating on that when you uh, go in there to check this? I'm going to actually show it to you. You've had an opportunity to hear how the teams were developed in that classroom interaction. But on August 30th, we did 15 schools, and there were over 340 observations completed. The seven elementary schools, five middle and three high, they're listed. On September 20th, we did 13, 14, 18 schools. <laughs> 
over 370 occupations <coughs> in the East Eastern schools listed. In October 16, there were 300, over 300 observations completed. So that's over 9,000 observations across the school system. What is that? Oh, I'm sorry, I have money on brain. <laughs> 1,000. Um, and you see all of the schools listed as well. Dr. Mills, was it, were these announced that they know you were coming? Yes, ma'am. The, the, the individual teachers, though, did they know you were coming in there? Yes, ma'am. Every school was, was, was told that they were coming, and they were to train their teachers. Now, if we have been talking about Elliot in the school system for at least three years. So the conversation about Elliot in the classroom for the teachers is not a brand new conversation. So they did the training last January. They did the training again in um, in August and September prior to the visit. So all of the teachers are aware of the seven learning environments. They're aware of what they should look like in their classrooms. They have access to the advanced, the principals have access to the advanced head training videos and they have shown those, many of them have shown those to the teachers. So they now and let me tell you, I, I really am impressed with what you guys are doing, the fact that you're out there is great. But I think another component would be the unannounced. I think you're gonna get more. I said this last time it wasn't a put it down when teachers know, I mean having I'm still a teacher, I've been been teaching thirty eight years, almost forty. Um you, 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 you're going to get the dog and pony show. I mean, you know that. And, and the kids are like, you know, and I, I'm like, no, ma'am. No, but let me address that in a different way. And as Ms. Pitt said, that what we're doing is building capacity in our, with our principals and with central office so that they can do the sweeps. But we have schools in the system, we have principals in the system right now who are doing sweeps all the time in their building, and they are not announced. And so they'll That's have good. an opportunity to match their data with ours and continue to build data platforms and data mines so that they can address those areas of, of the classroom environments that are most particular for their teachers and their schools in general. Is there documentation of that? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, we, we actually put all the seats in a database. So the areas are in the database. So you can see them all. One other thing I want you to say is kids are really honest. They are really honest. Um, for example, and I won't call the school, of course, but I remember in a classroom, some kids had a computer, and I sat down and I said, what are you doing? He was very honest what he was doing. He said, ah. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't think those things you can plan for. But by the same token, in that same classroom, a child two seats down, what are you doing? Well, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Da, 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 da. Kids are very honest about that. And remember, we're not talking to the teacher. I even had one school we went into and the teacher said, can I explain something? I said, not at this time. We're looking at students, what they're doing, and we're talking to them. And they are, they, they tell it all. They really do. And although we say that we're going to X school on this day, they know we're going into language arts classes and we're going into math. But if we have more time, we went into some science classes. We went into some history classes. And pretty much the data matches across the board, which is awesome because it tells me that we see what our strengths are, but we also know what our weaknesses are. We do. Is it? Is it? Is it? Not, I know I've asked you. I think I wish the, you guys would let the board at least come, you know, be a, you know, watch what's going on, not be a part of it, but maybe just watch because I think we would understand it more. And I, I, honestly, I'm glad you've done this PowerPoint. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Um, simply because you said you're going to share some things. So I'm like, I'm already, this, this is what I wanted the last time, an original, so upset because I didn't have something like this. So thank you. What is the objective of going through this exercise? Which, which exercise? Let's go into the The and the writing down the numbers and everything. At the end of the day, what do you end up with? And how, how have our students benefited? We're going to get to that just a moment. Um, Mr. Lee, you, you're like one slide ahead of us each time. But so okay. his questions are, <laughs> his questions are on point. Right, his questions are, are it's like you, You're like one slide ahead of us each time. We're probably going to get there. Mm -hmm. right. So what we want to do is point out just some basic overall system results. And one of our areas of strength is, this, is the area of supportive learning. 
And it's just like Ms. Um, Pitts just talked about, the students were willing to talk about what they were learning and they even explained to us what they were learning. And so they're taking risks by sharing their thoughts and opinions and ideas and they don't, when you have a student that is willing to talk about aloud in front of the class, in front of everybody, about what they're learning, that's a confidence builder. And that's about what they know and how well they're, how comfortable they are about expressing their um, accomplishments, <coughs> their academic accomplishments. But the other thing that's important is just as Ms. Pitts talked about the student who was willing to say what they were doing and he was able to explain it to her, I had a student who said, let me tell you what we're doing, but he was actually explaining it to the student next to him. He was willing to provide that support, that peer-to-peer -peer support, so that that's the student that he was sitting next to could actually grasp the concept and continue to move further. So that supportive learning is something we saw in many of our schools, and so that's an area of strength for the district. And we're, when we're talking about a very good strength, we're not talking about one school. When um, Dr. Harrison went through all of this, at every school almost, this was something that they were rated high on, that they were in a supportive learning environment. We thought that was great. Um, I cannot think of one school that I actually went to where I was a team leader or if I was on the team that I didn't see a lot of that going on. Um, there was one, I, I got back and I told Dr. Moore, I just got to see you, I got to see you. And she said, well, what is I said, in this school, it is remarkable. And it's a school that I, I did not think would be remarkable in that sense, um, because it's such a quiet little school. But sometimes great things go in a quiet little place. Um, this kid, you could tell this was not orchestrated, because when we walked in, they didn't pay us any attention. They didn't care that we went there. They were about their business. But this kid, they went over, they were a technology expert, and he had a sign that said technology expert. He knew to go get it. He put it around, and you could tell they took turns doing that. And he went over. Anybody that was having technical difficulties, he was like, okay, let's figure this out. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, can you come to my office and help me? Um, but he went and he, he saw every technology issue. And if he could not, he took his little sign off, and he said, wait a minute, I know someone who knows to do that. Wow. He put it on the next student, and he said, so I'm going behind this next little one, and he's working on it. They got it all solved. An adult never had to say anything other than the teacher watching this happen. Now, I actually asked the course, because I'm nosy and because I thought it was a good question. I said, what if you can't solve it? And you put that little rope around everybody's neck in the classroom. And he said, well, first I wouldn't put it around everybody's neck because everybody's not a technology expert. <laughs> and I said, okay. He said, it's just certain ones of us that can do this. But if not, then my teacher can fix it. How awesome is that? So supportive learning environment across all of the schools, that was one of our strengths. What grade was that? That was a second grade class. Oh. And how precious is that? Um, area of concern. Did he hang it around your neck? <laughs> <laughs> I think he can look at me and say, he probably can't do it. <laughs> I will say on that day though, I did not wear high heels. I did wear slacks and I had on flats, which is an accomplishment in itself. All right, but our area of concern, and I'm not shocked by this. We have tons of technology. We do. But who usually uses that? The teacher. In very few classrooms that you really see the kids using the technology. The teacher could use it great, and there were so many opportunities, and this is getting to what you were talking about, where <coughs> we could see where I would have been awesome if you let the kids do that. We went to an awesome room, a math class, and the teacher did all of these great things in geometry, and he used the protractor. He was great. <coughs> if he had only allowed a few students to go do that and show what they could do, that would have been awesome. Because if you can teach it and you can demonstrate it, you pretty much master it. It's hard to teach, and all of us who have been teachers before, we know that. It's great to know the content, but to be able to explain it and impart that knowledge is something totally different. Um, so we did make notes of that. So our biggest area of concern is not that we don't have the technology, the kids aren't using it. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's our area of Central office uh, will also be there, 
And what the object of the game tomorrow is to make sure that teach that principals have their data, they see what their areas of strength and, and concern are, and then we want to provide them guidance on how to communicate that those results to the building, and then use the data to create patterns. Um, it says conceptualize patterns of ratings across the learning environments. So we'll be looking at the learning environments to make sure that we can tie the data back to that area so that you provide professional development in that area. Moving forward, we're also proposing on the 6th and 7th of November that we bring in someone to do the art of engagement. And this is actually going to bridge into the next, the next item on the agenda. The art of engagement is a professional development activity that focuses on the seven learning environments and how to create that learner-centered classroom, um, that those learner-centered opportunities in classrooms and to improve student engagement across schools, across content areas. So that art of engagement activity is um, uh, proposed for November 6th and 7th. And then we're also going to provide that same training for central office because the object of the game with advanced ed is not for them to just keep coming and coming and coming, but as they come, they build capacity so that we can continue these activities and these initiatives across the years, and it continues to build within our system. Any questions? Let me share one more thing about the Elliot observation. If you don't see it, you can't say that you did. You can't. So you would rate that just as you see on there too. Um, if you think you might see it, you still can't rate it as you saw. You have to be real honest about what you saw and what you did. And even if it's your most favorite person in the world, you think she's doing a great job, how can she grow if you say that you could have possibly seen something? Because you think it's probably gonna happen later after you leave if you didn't see it. The key is to go back at a different time. And that's the principle of doing it, doing it various times. I might go at the beginning of the lesson this time, I might have to the end of the lesson this next time. I might have to the middle so I can see. I'm looking at patterns and trends. And one of the other things they're doing is the same principal is not going into that same teacher's classroom. The principal is going, the assistant principal may go on another day, a reading coach may go on another day, so that after they've collaborated with one teacher, they're able to create a pattern of what they see for that particular teacher that they're working with. They're working with. And in addition to that, then I was going to draw the staff does pop in. Yes, ma'am. I've been in several classrooms and I've conducted an early tweet. She's actually so. on the team. We all go. Mr. Because Ronald's we need to be able to help when you go out. Right there. And like I said, everyone has been trained um, so that we are building our own capacity, uh, which is it's awesome to me, um, so that we can actually do those things when advanced ed is not here. Or the State Department is not here. We can constantly improve our classrooms ourselves. And one other thing, it helps with our professional development, I'm sure. That's You're really more specific, specific now. Yes. And that's what we're doing today. So, y'all are always nice. Y'all are one slide up here and each time. Okay. We don't have a visual PowerPoint for the next part of the conversation, but the Elliott sweeps and the Elliott observations do the same thing. And the conversation about the art of engagement, all is about um, improvement priority four, directive one, fostering a culture of student-centered learning that promotes research-based practices. So as you, so what I wanted to do is reference the PowerPoint that you received in your packet to see if you have any questions about the background documentation. And then if you have any questions about the contract that you also have with them. So the Elliott sweeps and the art of engagement go together because the art of engagement is going to actually provide that professional development support that Ms. Smith just spoke about for our teachers, principals, and our central office staff. Is this the only, is this, this is the only Yes, ma'am. I'm going to piggyback on what Ms. Boyd said, it, and it's, I, I think this is right. But I'm looking at all this, and I, I'm like, I feel like we're checking boxes in 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, I mean, it would take me 20 minutes to read this. 
I mean, I guess you're going in ready, but yeah. yes, if, if you're, you're so trying. busy checking, are you really watching and seeing this? You're watching and see, you're watching and seeing and checking at the same time. But what we do, what what we do is we do that calibration initially, so that you get an opportunity to see the classroom and talk to each other about how you're going, how you're reviewing the information, reviewing the classroom, so that when you go on to the classroom by yourself, you really can see all of those things. But then all of our Central office staff have been trained, and we've calibrated together. We work through seeing that classroom and seeing all situations at the same time. And you take notes, I'm sure. I have my notes on that. And, and the, other, the other piece is that when you're doing this observation, it's not going to be in the order that you see right. it on the page. Yeah. You may go from section A down to section G, back up because you there are certain things that you that you see and they appear as you're observing. And so you're not going to be going down the page necessarily. It won't be in that order. But you have to know what you're looking for and you have to know it when you see it. And then you kind of know where it is on the page so that you can go in and check. And you also we also gave when we were trained, we gave each person a page of look forwards. For example, under one um, of the learning environments, all of these things you, you should see. And if you see all of those things, you can do it so many times, it's really like second nature. Okay, let's say, let, me, let me go through with you. Okay, I'm just asking a second. Let's say you go down and everything's great. It's all four. It's four, maybe one, three, it's all four. And we get to the end of the year, and we look at their proficiency rates, and they're still under 50%. What has this instrument done to make it change? I want to remind you, uh, Madam Chair, this is not a teacher evaluation. Right. This is looking at the instructional practices and how the student is engaging in the classroom. It's not an evaluation of the teacher. Okay. Um, Ms. Roller, I want to remind you that I didn't ask that, okay? I asked you, okay? I didn't ask you, I asked this. How does this help with proficiency? I would expect to think, this was nothing on the teacher. I think you misunderstood my question. My question dealt with, if you do all this, if you jump through all these hoops and they get all fours, and we still have proficiency rates that are 2% or lower, what did this do to help student achievement? Is that not what we're here for? Or did we I miss the boat? We take the data from the Elliots and we model our professional development for our teachers. We improve the craft of teaching. We provide support for our teachers based on the information that we collect from the other. <coughs> still didn't answer my question. So How does that help with achievement? Uh, I guess it just doesn't. Oh, I was, <coughs> was going to say, I, I want to say this. Um, because you can drill down to an individual teacher, not a group, but an individual teacher when we look at this area. If this teacher has fours in every area, I would almost bet that her proficiency level is going to be pretty high because the <coughs> students are engaged at a higher level. Okay. But if we have an instrument that shows that that would happen, I, what I want to see is that this this actually increased somewhere. We could we could drill down and say, hey, this is working. Back this okay. Years. So what has to be working is that this teacher is already doing this and knows how to do it. And then we connect it with staff development so that teachers know exactly how they are to engage students as part of the training. And I would say over time that if this model is in place and you see people, teachers, children are engaged at a very high level, that you're going to see higher levels of proficiency over time. But you, you would have to drill down to an individual teacher to really see if, if her classroom has boards most of the time consistently. And will we have the ability to do that? Will we have the ability to do that, is what I'm saying? I think do in our accountability, when we come to state assessments, that we are able to look at an individual teacher and to see how those students are. If I can just add two things. How does all of this interact with Hold on, there. Hold on, hold on, hold on there. <laughs> this is great. But well, one of the things I wanted to, to your, to your point, I see what you're saying, but I, just you know through my recent years of teaching and i still teach you're looking for the progressive game when they go in and they're giving them that professional development 
you may not see top of the line on the first assessment, but you can look at the gains over time, yeah. over time being mm -hmm. made. My second point that I wanted to add to that is I'm sure as principals walk in and central office staff and coaches and whoever, they may walk in and say, I just want to see A and B today. And that's specifically yeah. what I'm looking that's for. That's possible. into putting this agenda together. The background behind all these items on the agenda, hours and hours and hours and hours of work to get it to the point where we can put it on the agenda and bring it to the board. So it's not a fly by night kind of a process. They actually do a lot of work overall to get this together. <coughs> that we do 
you are. And when I say we, it's really not MPS. These come directly from the State Department of Education. We can't certify anyone in MPS. We can't. There are a set of guidelines that we are required to use if we're going to alternatively certify anyone. So the first type, and he said that, I heard that none of the lead to anyone. I'm going to tell you exactly what they are, how we do them, and where they lead to. If we have, and you know that there's a teacher shortage. Um, just last week, I think it was June on the 12th, Dr. Moore and I did see it, what our teacher shortage areas are. Across the state, we're required to send to the State Department what areas are hard to fill. And this year, we marked almost all of them. And what I found out, is most other counties mark quite a few of them as well. We know math and we know general science, but special ed is becoming bigger and bigger of an issue of filling. And even some of our ele elementary ed. Um, the team went to um, to recruit, was it Auburn and Troy? Is that correct? Recently, and we had very few teachers that were actually, well, students that are graduating education, which concerns me greatly. But one of the ways that we can get certified is through an emergency certificate. First of all, you have to degree, have to have a degree in an applicable area or a related field. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. If we have a shortage on math teachers, and we do, I will hide that fact, then I can look at someone with a pure degree in math to get them an emergency certificate. I can get an engineer who has a lot of math classes, and we can get them an emergency certificate. Well, how do I do that? Well, first of all, they've got to provide a transcript. And it can't be a transcript that they just print off. It has to be official. It has to be unopened. It has to be opened by one of the directors, an initial that they opened it that it was nothing fabricated. Then they have to pay a $30 non-refundable fee to the State Department of Education. They don't accept cash. They don't accept checks. They have to send in a money order, and we take care of that for them. This route is something that they can only do one time in their professional career. You can only have an emergency one time in your career. And when I say one time, I really do mean one time. If, for example, we hire you and you need an emergency certification and um, we get it and it's school lasts from what, August to May and we get it in December, when May is up, you've used it. You can't say, well, can I go to the next December? No. That's the last year. And once you've done that, you can't use it again. It requires that you have a background clearance, like any other certificate. And the good thing about that is can, we can pull in people from other areas that have a specialty. Um, and we do do that. Currently, right now, we have 49 emergency certificates. Now, I've heard that we look on the, the website and we don't see that non-certified. That's not a true statement. Because the State Department issues that certificate, we submit the paperwork, they process it, it goes through all of their channels, they make sure they have the $30 refundable fee, they make sure they have all of their boxes checked. Once they do that, remember, they're not working just with Montgomery Public Schools, they're working with everyone in the state of Alabama that applies for this. Once it's granted, you'll see on there, I think it says EMR, and it shows their certificate, and it is a valid, acceptable certificate. Um, what does this lead to? Well, it can lead to a different kind of certificate, which I'll talk about next, which is called a provisional certificate. After you've had an emergency, what we're doing is we're prepping you because we know we still need math teachers, and we know we still need for you to have the next certificate. We can get you on a provisional certificate. Well, there's some qualifications for that. First and foremost, you have to have a minimum of a 2.75 <coughs> on your official transcript. And what our directors do right now, when we look at emergency um, people candidates, if you don't already have that 2.75, we're real skeptical about, 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 about hurting you. Why? 2.75, first of all, is not that. But not only that, I need for you to teach another year and I need to be able to get you a provisional certificate. So I'm looking at those things. You must pass the applicable praxis, whatever that is. Whatever your core is, you've got to pass the praxis. And you have to pass the praxis for. The practice court is just a basic skills test. We say basic, but it's tough sometimes for some people to pass. It's, com it's comprised of math, writing, and a reading portion. So they've got to do all of that. Then during that time, they've got to enroll in some coursework as well.
During that year, the first year, they've got to take and pass two classes. There's a total of four classes that they'll have to take during that time. This can take up to three to four years to actually get them completely certified. When I say completely certified, what you're used to seeing is a valid traditional certificate. But in that first year, when we do the first one, they have to take two classes. And these are the four classes, and they can choose whichever two they're going to take first, because they got to take all four things. They have to take classroom management, strategies for teaching special ed students in an inclusive classroom, methods of teaching, and evaluation of teaching and learning. Those are the four required during that three to four year period. And the reason we say four, they can take a year off if they need to, it could be financial or something, because remember they're paying for all of this. And if they can't do that, they need to take one year off, they can do that. Not only that, in three years, or four, if they take a year off, they're gonna receive their standard professional certificate. And what does that look like? What does that look like? It's going to lead to a class B certificate. That's that bachelor's level certificate is what they'll get. Um, they still have to have a background clearance. They're usually assigned a mentor. Right now, in MPS, we have 49 emergencies and we have 40 provisional certificates. So every year while you're on this provisional certificate, you'll do a provisional certificate one, two, and then on the third year, if you've made, you've made all the requirements, then you get that standard certificate that we're all used to. But each year, you'll see on that per person's record that they have a certificate that is valid, and that is accepted and given by the State Department, not the public schools. Then the next one is an interim certificate. Um, once again, you have to have the official transcript showing your bachelor's degree or higher. Then with this one, is someone who is trying to get a master's degree, they must be unconditionally admitted to their college or university. They must be unconditionally admitted. And I say that because we have to say that to everyone that we do that. They'll bring something that says, unconditionally admitted, it means there's something you haven't done. So we can't accept that. The state won't accept that. They have to be unconditionally admitted into their educator program. Once they do that, then they have to pay the $30 non-refundable free fee. They've got to have a background clearance. A mentor is assigned, assigned. It leads to the class A certificate. Now, the other one, you remember, you had to take some classes. There were four classes I told you about. With this one, during the year, the second year, they have to pass three courses, whatever that college outlines for them to take. Then the next year, they've got to do four of those classes. They can't just take them. They have to pass them as well. And then they have to meet any other requirement that the university requires. So those are our routes that we use to get people certified. Now, even with an interim, um, emergency, or the provisional, you're not going to see it automatically as soon as, soon as we have a deadline, October 1st. We have to submit everything to the State Department. <coughs> and then they start processing. If they run into a problem, they call us and say, where is, or can you give us feedback on, whatever it is. We provide that information to them or we give them the contact information of that individual because they have to sign something. We have to sign something. And all of that is submitted. Then you'll start seeing those certificates come in <coughs> and you'll see that those people who we hired under an alternative route does have a valid certificate by the State Department of Education. Questions about that? That's probably too much information. Um, but I'm trying to just clear up any misconception that we may have about how our people certified. And these are the routes that they go through. The other thing is, um, since I'm doing employment for well, general personnel issues, we had a question earlier today, and Dr. Keith, I'd love to, to, to answer it for you. You asked the financial auditors about an audit, because apparently you think I'm making that up. Well, no, I, no, I just wanted, like I said, I, when I said it, I want to hear from the horse's mouth. Okay, well, it's it nothing. It's no disrespect. I, I keep you and I have talked already. When you misspell words uh, in, 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 in the, the certified, when they come up uncertified, when you tell me one thing and I see the other, little things, I, I, I'm losing the trust. And I just, when you have the horse right there and you th you hear audit, when you're like me, you're like, hey. They confirm it. I did, it, would, it was just that second confirmation that because I I did I leave here taking what you said to me as the gospel, and then yeah I'm gonna go check it. And when when they don't add up, 
I, I had some concerns about it. And that's why, especially for this conversation to be taking place when I've asked for it since June, and we're, and we're having it in October, in almost November, if, you, if you're me, you're like, why can't we talk about this? What's the big secret? You know, that's, I'm sorry. You so, know, you know, sorry, I'm just gonna clear it up. was an sorry. auditor and I, and I listened to you when I went and asked people that know, they went, at least that's not true. And then, then who am I supposed to believe? So it's not the same audience, so she can yeah, explain that. that. It's not the same. It's just Money, people. Yeah. And, I, and I got that now. But. Okay, well let me, let me share, so we can do some research that will help First, there was an audit. Um, in November of 2013, we were all over the newspaper for a variety of things about that audit. You were even quoted in the newspaper as having a comment during that time. If you need it, I have it for you right here. Actually, come in. It's probably the same that I've made every year. So you could, I don't need it. But that's okay. All right. All right. Carry on. Okay. But I will say this. We were given instructions, and we actually had an interposition person at the time. And I think the board probably remembers, we had to come and do all of these 30, 60, 90 day plans based on the audit findings from the interposition person that was here. Actually, we went back and pulled our 30, 60, 90 that we did. One of them was that HR could no longer have those interviews, and I think I explained to the group how we heard them all in, and we interviewed them from up front, and they were scared, terrified, they were. We had to give that. In the audit finding, we had to give principals back the autonomy to do those things because they said that that was not the right way to do it. Additionally, but what, but that's, 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 that's not in any state book. I was shown there's not a state law. If you remember, you, yeah, but you came in here and showed us. You, you set it up in front of the board and said, it's a team approach. I help, this helps, this helps. And you told me a couple of weeks ago, okay, we don't do that anymore. It's just the principal. It no, I did is. not say that, Dr. Hughes. I said I did not say it was just the principal. You told me so that. So let's do oh, this. I'm, 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 I'm going to take it you now, and I'm going to go it. back to those tapes. Let, let's let okay. her explain what That's she's right. trying to explain so that everybody can hear it. It is never just the principal. If it's a central office position, and I want to go on record saying this, if it is a central office position, we have a family. We do that. If it's at the school, the principal and whoever, whomever his team is. Sometimes they invite someone from HR. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they come up with their own panel of people to interview. And they have the right to do that. What they do have to do is submit all of that information to HR. There's some actual questions on there that we have to make sure that they don't get us in a sticky situation. Did you tell me two weeks ago when we talked that Dr. Dr. Moore, Moore was going to help me with this if I would just listen? Dr. Moore. You're telling me you've never said that to me. Dr. Moore, at this point, what I want to do is that there are some key points, some more bullet items that Ms. Pitts wants to list. If you would go ahead and list those, and let's move on to the voting section of the agenda, please. Thank you. I thought this was general discussion. If we're not discussing, Pitts, you're going to shut you go us ahead, down. Would you go ahead and list uh, the points, please? You have me as the presiding person. What I don't Ms. understand Ms. is why you're shutting me down. You're going to go ahead and present those key points. Go okay. ahead. And well, let, let it be documented that I was shut down by the state. I'm um, talking about personnel, which I've asked since June. Go ahead, Ms. Pitts. Go ahead. All right. As a result of that, as a, as a result, we actually had to do a training with principals during leadership council. We did that. Not only that, we started, so that everyone understood, we started out sending from HR something called the resource. And they received a newsletter on what the hiring protocol call is and what those expectations are. Um, just so that we know that we're all on the same page. Um, and that is what the audit led to. It was not a financial audit. Uh, we didn't get to choose whether we, we were being audited or not. Um, there's newspaper documentation saying the audit was actually printed in the newspaper. And we went by just what those bullets said that we had to do. And we did those things. And then our interposition person was actually removed because we met those goals. Questions, comments, or concerns? It wouldn't matter. Okay. I'd be shut down. All right, Dr. Moore, can we move to the next section? Do you have any comments, Dr. Moore? No. Okay. Madam <coughs> Chairperson, please. Uh, let's look at items for consideration under item A. Do 
I recommend approval of the board minutes from August 28, 2018. I move that we approve the board minutes from August 28, 2018. Second. You got carried. Okay. Mary, where am I going to vote? Okay, let's have a vote. Okay, we have a second. Let's have a vote. We've already done. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. okay, I recommend approval of the MCVOE and AUM memorandum of agreement. I move that we approve the MCVOE and AUM memorandum of agreement. Second. Second. Mary? Second. Mary? 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 Technology Magnet Rental Agreement. I move that we approve the Impact MPS Brew Baker Technology Magnet Rental Agreement. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. <coughs> Motion carries. I recommend approval of the River Region Psychiatry LLC Agreement. All in favor? We need to get I move that we adopt the river region. I kind of agree with the LLC. Second. Colonel in favor? Unanimous. Motion carried. Okay. I recommend approval of the Monsito Web Governance Suite. I move that we approve the Monsito Web Governance Suite upon the basis of the recommendation of Superintendent. Second. Colonel in favor? I have, what is that, Mary, you didn't have your hand up. Unanimous? Okay. okay, so let me ask this question. <laughs> Are train service agreement? Are we? Well, Melissa said, and after hearing the whole discussion, that we put it back on keeping the old agreement. And I said, okay, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. So we have to make sure you don't have Madam Chair, Vice Chairman, I move that we accept the superintendent's 
um, request to approve personnel report support personnel support report. Personnel, it's just really okay. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing that with the one second. You get the time. <laughs> Personnel report certified agenda number one. Uh, Madam Vice President, I move that we adopt the personnel report certified agenda number one. Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, and that's into motion carries five one. Okay, and so last we have a an item that was added. K. Um, recommendation of a resolution to repeal the Alabama Accountability Act. Mr. Lee has um, copies of a resolution that he shared with the board. Um, so I move that we approve the resolution to repeal the Alabama Accountability Act. A lot of the school boards across the state are doing this and um, last week I believe Baldwin County all voted to do that. Um, this Accountability Act uh, has taken the funds out of public schools all across the state and um, as Mr. Watt stated, I mean, we're already hurting and this is just another way that money was taken away from public education and put into private education and I just would like to appeal to this board that we make it stand and just to show our delegation of legislators that um, we, we want public funds in public schools. Second. Okay, I think there needs to be this. Okay, we need to be in discussion. Uh, how you do that, the motion is made, it's a second, then you open the floor for discussion, and then okay. after discussion, you vote, vote okay. it up and vote it down. Okay. All right, we have a second? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I said. Okay. Now you ask for the discussion. Now the discussion. Is there any, any discussion? Okay. I think, you know, we, we have sat up here. I have two, 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 two points to make. Number one, how we're sitting here as a board and deciding on that when that has really nothing to do with the board, I don't know, but that's just my comment. The next thing is, you know, you, we, we talk about kids in poverty all the time. And I wonder how many up here, I, I know Mr. Lee does, I've seen his articles, but how many up here really understand that this Accountability <coughs> Act is really helping kids in poverty. Those kids that are in poverty right now are that, that are using that Accountability Act, number one, to never have been to a private school. And the state is paying two of them. If you look, at only $5,000 of it, by the way. The, the other, the school has to suck it up. I've got, and I can't use them, but a file right here. I'm teaching sixth graders right now that came from the public school system that are all in second and third and fourth grade, but yet I'm teaching sixth grade. I just got, I've only been teaching six, six days. And these poor kids, they can't get the, the, the education that we're trying to get kids of poverty to have, suddenly have a choice because we have a state law that has given them a chance because it may be taking our money, but it's taking our money and using it to educate it where places we aren't doing it. We are mishandling funds, and we've been doing that. But like I said, you know, that's fine. I, I was shut down on the whole personnel thing. At this point, we have a call for a vote. Well, I have one more to add to this. I'm glad the public seeing this. I wish I were filming this to put on Channel 12. It's filmed, it's filmed. I do want to add that the same you more. Made, you hopefully, you'll have that new board. You made some value. I may not be on it, but hopefully, you will not be like that. But I did want to say. You would do that if you were the acting president right now or vice president. Go ahead. 
Okay, um, uh, two things I want to make. You made some valid points. But I do want to say this. Public education for years now has been underfunded. And anytime you take away, if you are to, and, and the money does go in, so yes, it does help a child. But the true discussion that needs to be had is why is public education not being funded at the federal level appropriately and at the state level appropriately, and even at our local level <coughs> appropriately, appropriately. We need to fund our public education so that we can offer that good quality of education. And, and you know, private schools, that's people's, that's, that's their choice. But it is a paid choice. You, you leave something that you're paying for in your tax dollars and then choose to go pay for something else. It's a paid choice. But if we get the funding that we need, those poor children, I, I was one, I'm still poor, but I was one of those poor children that appreciated my public school education, if I'm not mistaken, you graduated from public school as well. But if, just imagine if we could give them everything that's being given to them in those public schools if we were funded appropriately, and that's just my point. But I'm and I, and, and I appreciate say, your answer, but like our proficiency rate shows exactly what we're not uh, may, may I add just one little basic point, whether we vote to repeal the Accountability Act or not. The research really shows that those children who go to other private schools or wherever on private on scholarships really are not performing at a higher level for whatever reason. So that's just a point I think we all need to consider. If they were performing generally overall at a higher level because they left wherever they left and went to wherever they went to based on a scholarship, if it showed that they were performing at a higher level, then there would be an argument for that. But that research does not show that. It does not bear that out. Thank you. Okay, Mr. B. Do I have a motion to uh, repeal? We already have a motion. We 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 have a motion. And it's not about against the children, it's about funds that we need for our children. Let's just get the money. So we can get our friends and family. Thank okay. you, meeting is All right, we're going to